you can't really replace the feeling that you get when you're figuring things out. That's kind of the name of the game. Ah, beautiful river. How's the falls look there? Um, unrunnable. Unrunnable. Number one looks unrunnable. Does it look lineable? Mm, maybe. It should be a real good level to fish it. As long as we get the boat over those drops. We'll just throw the boat off of them. But if there's good ones to run, we'll just run them. That could be a flipper right there. I think I always wanted to be a fly fishing guide. Before things got going in the Northeast with us, the Northeast was a pretty hard place to guide. There wasn't a lot of opportunities. Fishing fully took over in college when I decided that I didn't want to study anymore. I went to Knowles first semester and I uh, went to guide school right after that and then dropped out of school promptly at three and a half years. At the time, yeah, it was rough. I mean, it would be rough on any parent trying to you know, thinking, oh, they're going to graduate from college. But I've also learned that he wasn't happy either. You know, he wasn't happy being in a classroom. My name's Dan Harrison. My brother and I own Harrison Anglers in Western Mass. We officially launched Harrison Anglers fall of 2006. We knew we wanted to fish all the time from a very young age, but the whole making it a career thing came in later. We got like our first opportunity out in Montana. I got a job working for Glacier Raft Company as a fishing guide and a whitewater guide. When we went out west, we weren't looking to make a career out of anything. We were just looking to have a summer job and you know have a good time and learn running rivers. The draw to go out west, in my mind, growing up, the fishing was a lot better out there. Glacier was awesome. I mean, we would be doing trips into the Bob Marshall Wilderness on Cessnas one day and then just grinding it out in the whitewater section three trips a day the next week. It was a big variety of guiding, so we got a lot of experience there. Out West was like a way to get my foot in the door. There wasn't any opportunities to guide in the Northeast that were readily available to somebody that was just starting. Chile came into the program when we were in Glacier and Dan had made some contacts. We were just trying to piece together the seasons at that point to try to make it a year-round career. I was just coming back from Chile, and the girl that I was dating at the time got a job back here in the Northeast, and uh, we decided to stay. Truth be told, his girlfriend wouldn't let him go out there for the fourth summer, so that was the main reason. And I started kind of using the techniques that we were taught out west and, you know, sending boats down different sections of the river here. And that's when we kind of got onto the fact that there was a lot more wild trout in Western Mass and Southern Vermont than we thought when we were growing up. I was out doing the same thing we'd been doing in Glacier. He was hitting me up with the text and stuff of wild brown trout that he was catching on rivers that we grew up fishing that we didn't know had wild brown trout in them. It's a big one. Nice bow. They're like lost, forgotten rivers. They were polluted and killed off during the Industrial Revolution. While the Industrial Revolution brought wealth to some and jobs for others, it came with a price tag. Pollution from coal-powered factories turned the cities black. Lack of housing created the first urban slums. It's just a lot of stuff that people have overlooked over the years as, you know, potential trophy fisheries. 
The main mindset about New England trout streams in general is that they're polluted so bad that they can't hold fish and grow wild fish. As the rivers got cleaned up over the last few decades, the fish came back. Yep. These rivers are hard to fish. You gotta understand what's going on. These are not rivers that have thousands of fish per square mile. Some of those rivers may have only 30 fish a mile. Where we're fishing, there's not a whole lot of access for boats to go down. We're throwing boats off sides of cliffs. We're winching them out up cliffs, dragging them in to put them in the river. It's a lot of work. It's not like anyone can just come out and fish these rivers and have success. What they did was bring these rafts back and the whole thing was just like revolutionary for this area. I can't overstate that, like no one was doing that. Tom was kind of opposed to everything that I did in my early 20s, but he still followed me and did it. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. Tom, he's the general. He takes care of, you know, what needs to be done behind the scenes a lot. Dan's a wild card. You wanna have a fucking good day, you go with Dan. That's about it. <laughs> You're gonna have fun. He's always exploring and he's never stagnant. Harrison Angler's kind of set the tone and just having that attitude that we're gonna go anywhere we can, fish any water we can, use winches. The early years, every single time we put into a new section of the river, we realized that that section had just as many fish as the one that we were on the day before. And we just kept working our way down the deer field, up and down the Millers, up and down the Swift, and being on a new section of the river every day all summer long. One night we started ripping apart an old Tacoma and put a flatbed on it and put a boat on it and realized that if we added a winch and a couple rollers, we could get in and out of anything. It's in all the guides in the area use them now. At that point, I began to think that, you know, they're pretty serious about this. I never believed that they'd be able to do what they're doing now. Yeah, boys. The main reason we are so successful is because we will put boats where nobody else will put them. The sections of the river that nobody can get to are the best sections. Just an everyday float, we'll be running it down hills, dropping them off of the sides of cliffs, and then you're also having to drag in over a mile sometimes. The greatest thing about me and Dan's guide service is we got to find those bigger fish in those cool stretches of the river with the client. We have clients that floated some of the rivers for the first time with us back in the day that still go out with us five, six, seven times a year, and they're like family. I've been fishing with the Harrisons for 15 years or so. Yep. We've been yep. fishing ever since. My hair was brown when we started fishing. It's, it's, it's a little gray now, but we've caught a lot of big fish. We didn't really realize the 12 month fishery that we had here in the beginning. Like we didn't realize a lot of things, but we definitely discovered that we could float boats down rivers, you know, in this area all 12 months and catch fish. You're fishing for giant Northern Pike one day, giant Browns one day, big rainbows the next day. And it's like huge variety of fishing that is all 12 months. That's a big fish. Pull, pull, pull. Stay tight, strip. Oh, 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 I like everything better when I'm figuring it out. I'm always looking for new water. In the fall, everybody's like pretty burnt out. Guide trips definitely fall off a little bit, but that definitely frees up some of our main guides to get out together and give us their opinions on what rivers they want to check out. We kind of take all of our games to those rivers and see what we can do. Tomorrow we're thinking about checking out a new river that none of us have ever floated before. I've been looking at this river for a long time. We don't know what to expect at all. From what we've seen online, it's a lot of waterfalls and a lot of really good looking pools. 
it's nice to just get out and just see something I've never seen before. Beautiful river. What falls like that? Um, unrunnable. Unrunnable. Yeah, nice little goat path down there. Oh, yeah. Boat. If we put it at that next bridge up, we'll have four of these to go through, which is doable. Hey, Tom. It's never enough with them. He's so addicted to this, she wants to go find the next best thing. We should run one through there empty first. I'm gonna take one boat over, send it down through with nobody in it. Yeah. You're gonna catch it or somebody's gonna catch yep. it. It's almost like right through the middle right over there, right? Let Dan rip it and line the rest. I'm just fired up. Yes, sir. In there. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah, boy! Might not be a way around this bitch, Phil. <laughs> Is he going right through, baby? Can't find a brown trout, find a waterfall. That could be a flipper right there. Oh boy, yellow header. Oh, it's a nice one. Good job, Cam. <laughs> Came out, I knew that. Yeah, this looks like a fun one. Yeah, if you get stuck or go sideways, you're done. Let's see what the ghost boat does. See, Dan, I don't know about that move. It's too big, it's too shallow. He's gonna get psyched out if he stands up there too long. Oh, he's going to come right down. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> when you're checking out a new river, Fuck you could either man. have stumbled across something amazing, or a lot of the times you end up cutting trees down and dragging boats oh through. Oh, my God. But you never know, and until you get there, and until you see it and try it, then you're, ne you're never gonna know. Yeah. We'll be back. Yeah, we'll be back. Dan and I started floating the rivers around here, and that's how we were figuring out, you know, what lives there and what we can catch out of there. The great thing now is there's a lot of people around with rafts doing the same thing, which has created this awesome community of, you know, float boat fishermen around here, which we love and are a part of and, you know, wouldn't want it any other way. They brought these rafts back and the whole thing was just like revolutionary for this area. I can't overstate that. No one was doing that 